everyone. Welcome to our webinar here today where we discuss the role and the importance of content at the center of the digital experience. And it's no surprise that outstanding digital experiences demand outstanding content. And that's why we're here today to help you get geared up for your new year content planning with some tips and motivation for taking a more holistic approach to your content strategy and the supporting technologies for your content strategy, which includes CMS and DAM. I'm Jake Athey, and I am the VP of Marketing and Sales for the Acquia Marketing Cloud products, and I come from Wyden, specializing in digital asset management. Uh, you know, joining you here from Madison, Wisconsin here today. And I'm joined by two incredible guests, including uh, Justin and Tammy, uh, Justin from Third and Grove and Tammy from Acquia. Would you like to introduce yourselves, please? Yeah, thanks, Jake. I'm Justin. I'm the uh, CEO and founder of Third and Grove. We're a digital agency uh, that works with a variety of uh, mid-market and enterprise brands in the consumer and B2B space. Uh, I'm in Boston. Our headquarters is in downtown Boston in the Jewelry Exchange Building. If you've been to Boston to buy a diamond or embezzle money, you've probably been in our building. It's a bit of a throwback to old school Boston uh, uh, in downtown. It's over 150 years old. Um, so we're here in Boston. We're distributed, though. We're in about 20 states um, and have team members all across uh, the U.S. It's great to be here. Awesome. And I'm Tammy. I'm a senior product marketing manager at Acquia. I specialize in CMS as well as low-code tooling like Site Studio. Uh, very excited to be here with you all and excited to have Justin uh, spotlighting with us as well. Excited to kick it off. All right. Thank you, Justin and Tammy. Again, we're honored to have you here with us today. Now, Justin and the great team at Third and Grove have been Acquia partners for a long time. And I really admire Justin's ideas, his passion, and his expertise. So we're happy to have him share his perspectives on how to overcome the top content challenges and deliver better digital experiences today. So Justin, take it away. Thanks, Jake. We'll see if you still admire it after uh, after what we walk through today, but I promise it'll it'll make sense if you stay through it, stay through the sequence. Um, okay, awesome. So uh, we work with, as I mentioned, we're a digital agency, work with a lot of brands, um, mid-market and enterprise, bunch of sectors all over. So we have kind of a unique perspective looking across that ecosystem, and we see a lot of folks dealing with um, uh, challenges in our space with content and digital experiences. We see a lot of solutions um, and strategies being tried, uh, and we see a lot of trends that happen across that space. And so we wanted to kind of share some of that um, that's really relevant to content and content strategy and, and, the, and, um, and the digital experience when we, um, when we talk about this today. So I thought it'd be fun to focus on a survey that we did recently. Um, it was just about a month and a half ago. We, we surveyed a bunch of global digital marketing leaders. They were U.S.-based, but they worked for organizations that typically had operations in the U.S. and, and overseas. And we asked them a bunch of questions in the survey. And, and one of the questions we asked, was what are your top you know two to three challenges that you're dealing with right now and across the survey results we saw very consistently the same like three things mentioned over and over and over again and so i want to go through those three challenges because we've there are some trends and some approaches and strategies that i think would be uh, relevant with dealing with these and i think they're probably common to most of us working in this space around around content and content strategy so those three challenges are no time to be strategic stale content um and the uh um uh challenge of trying to get more out of a budget that's probably fixed and not going to grow so more some more content more value more more engagement out of that same budget so we're going to go through each of these uh, individually. So the first one is no time to be strategic. And so this is probably um, a challenge many of you have encountered, but really it's this tension between the ability and to be um, uh, strategic uh, and like having the time to sort of think more broadly and then dealing with just a million tactical requests that come in every day and everything's a P0 and it's just a deluge of like the little tactical things and all of a sudden you're consumed by all the tactical stuff and, and you really um, uh, lose focus of what the strategy is and, and you don't sort of take time to, to focus on that. So there are two approaches I think to dealing with this problem that we've seen be successful that I kind of wanted to share. So the first one is uh, rethinking um, 
how you approach the production and creation of content in order to create some um, some time and some and, and get that perspective strategically. This is a photo of a B-24 Liberator bomber. This was a key aircraft that the United States produced to help us win World War II. This is a picture of it being assembled in a Ford um, uh, assembly plant in uh, called uh, called Willow Run, a really famous plant for, for what they what they achieved here. Before the war started, it took six months to put a B-24 together. A single plane took six months. They were all done manually by a team. The, the plane would just sit in a corner and it would be assembled slowly, bespoke uh, over time, uh, over that six month period. And when the war started, the government asked Ford to convert one of their car factories to produce this airplane, but we needed to produce a huge number of them very quickly in a short amount of time and the process wouldn't work. So Ford went and said, hey, we uh, went to the Air Force and said, hey, we want, we want to build um, these with an assembly line, like we do cars. And um, and uh, one of the, the military guys said, no, that's not going to work. I, no one can possibly do that. Why don't you just build the wings? Maybe you can do that. And the Ford guy who was in charge of this said, we'll build the whole damn plane or we'll build nothing. So they, they went to build the whole plane. But they didn't take a bes they didn't look at the bespoke process that existed and like tweak it and tweak little parts of it to make it more efficient. They went back to zero and they said, how do we build this plane in an entirely new way using this relatively new thing at the time, a uh, time called, called an assembly line. Um, and and they, they reinvented completely the way they sort of thought about putting a plane together. And the results were, were remarkable. I mentioned it took six months to put these planes together. At their production capacity peak during World War II, a new plane um, with a part, you know, the parts would come in on one end of the factory and 63 minutes later, a fully functioning B-24 bomber was ready to take off. An hour, six months down to an hour. And they didn't really change a lot about the plane. They just changed the way that they thought about creating that plane. So I think that's a really good way to, to do an exercise that might not be hugely time consuming, but do an exercise to really focus you to think a little more strategically about how your content is produced. So if you think about it more operational it. It's more like a supply chain, an assembly line, a factory production. There's all these different steps that content has to go through, and some of them recycle and change, right? You have to ideate the content and actually then, you know, what are we going to write? Write, you know, write the thing. There's probably multiple people involved in that process or tools. Then there's probably regulatory and legal steps you have to go through. Um, then you have to, uh, you know, deliver and distribute it to different channels, different technologies, um, different people, different teams, different divisions all over the place. Then once that content is is uh, distributed and published live, you need to measure its effectiveness. Is it is it working well on an email, but not on a website or in a social channel? There's a lot of data to collect and sort of measure then that gives you some information about how to refine that content. And then finally, the last step, which I think is, is sometimes overlooked, is how do we repurpose this content in the future? Maybe it's a different channel. Maybe it's changing what that content thinks. Maybe it's sort of recycling it into the process to, to send it through again, but make it more efficient and kind of change it. Maybe it's repurposing old content. But if you can take a minute to kind of sit down and think about how in your own organizations, a piece of content flows through this process from start to finish, you're, you're gonna force your brain to think holistically, you're, you're gonna look high level, and you're gonna see opportunities then to make this more efficient, to um, tweak the process, tweak maybe the ideation, all the different stages you can kind of, um, there'll be, there'll be much, more, much more clear opportunities. And because you're looking at the whole thing, you'll sort of understand how, how they all connect um, and, and can make that more efficient. So that's the first way I would suggest if you're having this challenge around um, no time to be strategic is, is a, an exercise that, that doesn't take a lot of time but really forces you to think a little bit differently, I think. The second strategy here to think more strategically is a, a lesson that's true about exercise and business and life and, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a universal truth, I think, which is if you wanna do something consistently, you have to do it in the morning. Our afternoons like don't belong to us. Our, our evenings don't belong to us. Things come up during the day that need to be addressed that day, whether it's work or there's something with the kids or there's, uh, there's an event after work or you're seeing some friends or there's stuff going on at night. Like the later on in a day that you go, the less and less control of that day that you have. And it's much harder to then put a pause to that, you know, 6 p.m. time slot and do something that you need to do because the rest of your day is already spoken for. So it, it's it's really true. Like if you want to like exercise over the long term, the best way to get that habit is do it in the morning, right? Because if you do something in the morning, you control that time and then everything else after the day can sort of be taken from you. But the thing that you want to have happen consistently, you've got to do it in the morning. This is a really good way to build in the strategy time that you need. So you're going to have to deprioritize something, right? Take that risk, take something tactical that you can put down. Um, and, uh, 
uh, uh, focus on, uh, oh yeah, thanks, sorry, the slide didn't advance, my apologies, thank you. Um, and so uh, take the time to kind of take a step back and, um, uh, uh, and carve out a little bit of time. It could be 9 a.m. on Mondays, right, for one hour on your calendar, block that time off to work on the strategy piece and just have a couple of questions. Maybe write a couple of questions that you answer every single week in terms of answering, um, you know, some key questions uh, to, to force you to think about that holistically. But if you can just carve out a regular amount of time and do it consistently, it's not every day. It might not even be every week, but if it's every other week and it's a dedicated amount of time that you protect, doing that thing in the morning is really going to um, ensure that you uh, you'll build um, uh, the, uh, you'll get the benefits of that strategic thinking um, uh, over time. It's really not about talent and smarts. It's just about doing something consistently for longer than other people, and that will help you win um, and, and beat your competitors. Okay, the second challenge that um, uh, I called out before was how to deal with stale content. So uh, stale content is... I mean, it's content that needs to be refreshed or isn't performing. It's not hitting your metrics. It's not engaging. It's not sort of driving the outcomes that you want anymore. It's sort of what to do with this, um, how to minimize the amount of time, but, um, uh, but how do you sort of get some content that's going to have more value out of it, uh, whether it's repurposing or, or the way that it's created. So I think for this challenge, it's good to take a step back and think about um, uh, the sort of the, 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 the content strategy overall that led to that content to be created. So the first thing... Um, to call out is I think there's three key elements of every effective content strategy. And I think, and I think these are generally the same regardless of the content, the use of the content strategy, whether it's consumer or B2B or um, a short campaign or something long. I think, I think all effective content strategies that we see tend to have these three components. The first one's work backwards. This is such a great, um, simple exercise to change the way that you think about something. So working backwards, all it really means is start with the outcome that you're looking for. Maybe you're trying to boost engagement, get people to sign up for a demo. Maybe it's um, uh, people to apply for, uh, for careers. Um, Whatever it is, start with that outcome and then work backwards from that outcome in the series of discrete steps that it takes to get there until you get to the step that informs what kind of content you should create. And it's just a simple mental exercise. I know it doesn't sound like it could be powerful, but it really will force you to ensure that every a bit of effort that you're making is going to work towards that goal. And it'll be really clear. So don't start with what piece of content do we need to write. Start with that outcome and then find out what needs to happen each step further and further away from that outcome. And then it will be really, really clear what kind of content to create. So I think that's that's a key exercise to do. The second one is what we've been talking about, which is you've got to take the risk to, to take a little bit of time to think strategically. And that means that something has to be deprioritized, right? So look at all of the tactical priorities that you have and find out the one that can take a hit. Maybe it will get less attention or maybe it, needs to, um, maybe it needs to have a little bit of a lower quality, but you need to get the time um, to put into a, a, a uh, the ability to sort of think more broadly and, and do those exercises. It's, I think it's far riskier to not take the time to do that because six, nine months, you'll be wondering why you're not hitting the goals that you're looking for. And it's because you've been stuck in a, in a tactical rut. And then the third key element, I think, to every content strategy is, is, is really easy in digital to forget that at the end of everything that we're doing is a human being. Like if you if you're in a retail store, like if you're running a if you're running like a, a clothing store, like your customers come in, you see them. You, you cannot forget that they're human beings because you're seeing them every minute of every day. But when we all probably work in digital environments, so we never see our customers, and so it's really easy to forget that it's just like it's like it's Aunt Mary at like. Christmas parties, like she's the HR person that you're trying to get through to sell your product or educate or engage in your brand, right? These are just human beings. And the data, there's so much of it. And there's so many metrics that you can use to measure content and its, and its effectiveness from a million different data sources. It's really easy to get lost that you, you still have to focus on that human being. Um, and, and that means that intuition and human intuition is absolutely crucial to the effectiveness of content strategy. Data is important. Yes, it should inform what you're doing. Yes, but you've got to remember that it's a human being, trust your instincts, use your intuition and never forget that you're talking um, uh, to, a, to a, living, a living, breathing person at, at the end of what you're doing. So those are um, the key components that we see of effective content strategies. The, um, uh, we, we generally see, once it's now sequenced out, a content strategy goes through these uh, three steps. And, and it's, it's, it's not rocket surgery. It's, it's a pretty clear process, one, two, and three. Um, but just wanted to go through these and kind of explain it because uh, 
because I think it's a really easy way to sort of fit in the different steps and iteration uh, interaction points that you want with um, with content. So what are those what, what are those three steps? Welcome and orient folks. Um, so welcome to the site and uh, 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 give them a path to go forward, and then. Um, uh, to build trust, this is going to be the longest one, uh, and we'll look at an example to make this more clear, but this is really building up all that credibility that you need to get to the third one, which is a clear step, right? A CTA, um, uh, uh, um, uh, an action, a form, an engagement, whatever it is, um, uh, that's really ultimately what you're trying to drive towards, but it's really kind of the last step. So what, is that, what does this actually look like in practice? So this is a real content strategy um, from a, a client. They, um, they're an enterprise organization. They sell uh, B2B tech products that are priced between like 20K annual subscriptions all the way up to about a half a million. So they sell a variety of products. Um, to you know, small, medium, and a lot of enterprise customers. Um, and so this was part. This was like, this was the content strategy that we came up with as part of a large redesign effort for um, this brand's uh, marketing presence, their their you know their their entire digital presence. And so the, those three flow steps are here, and then some of the specifics that we did are on the right, right. So orienting the the folks and welcoming them to the site for the first time. So a bold power statement, something that's going to be catchy, really communicate what what they're doing. Um, and then we did an interactive piece. So this was sort of a choose your own adventure. So maybe we can get them to answer a couple of quick questions, you know, yes or no, A or B sort of funnel them down on a next step that's gonna make more sense. This brand had a lot of products um, and served a lot of different customer sizes. And so it was important to sort of see if we get the customer to just get a little interactive and answer a couple of things so we can sort of send them in the, in the right direction. The trust phase was a bunch of different content and it was a really crucial set of, um, set of steps um, in order to build that trust. And so we had, you know, things that you're, I'm sure you're common that you've seen many times, like logos and testimonials and social proof and, um, you know, product information, um, uh, featured, you know, insights and articles and analysis and sort of helpful information to the potential buyers. So all of that was the trust phase. And all of that built up and filled that trust battery in order to um, get to that last piece, which is, you know, direct them on the next step and, you know, uh, um, uh, get them to what you want them to do ultimately, right? And that's the ask. You ultimately want them to fill out a form or get a demo or ask to talk to sales or, or you know, apply for a job, whatever it is, right? Whatever that key engagement metric is, you're going to ask them for something, but you can't. You can't get them to do it until you've built trust with them, and that's why it. That's why that piece takes so much time. The I think this brings up three key trends around this a content structured digital experience that we're, we're, um, uh, that we're probably all facing, but three really crucial trends right now. First one's the dark funnel. So the dark funnel is the percent of a B2B buying journey that happens before the prospect ever self-identifies and says, hey, I want to talk to you, right? Accenture did a study about the dark funnel. 60% of the buying process is done before they ever raise their hand and they say, hey, I'm, I'm Justin, I wanna to talk to you about your particular product. That means that they've done so much of, like so much of that trust building has already occurred before they reach out to you that if you don't do an effective job of it before you know who they are, they will, they will never reach out and self-identify and you will totally lose that prospect, right? So um, that, that trust phase is really crucial to that. Attribution, attribution software telling you where prospects came from is really tricky because so many of these touch points aren't necessarily measurable or noticeable. So it could be a podcast or social or a piece of content on your site or all of those things. But there's probably multiple touch points they went through before they talked to you. And one of them was probably the most crucial, but it's tricky to figure that out from attribution software because so much of it is hard to track. So, um, this goes into that, you know, if you do that trust phase effectively, you're hitting them in multiple areas in multiple ways, and it's going to cloud your data and attribution. doesn't mean your strategy is not working, um, but it means that you, you probably can't over-index on that particular set of data. And then the third trend is like the death of third-party cookies, right? It's not the apocalypse for that, though. All it means is that second party and zero party is more important. Second party is data you buy from other people, great. Um, and zero party is the data people give to you of their by their own choice. Like they decide to give you information. It's the most important data. It's gonna convert the best. It's gonna engage the best. It's what every sales team wants. Um, it's the most important data. And that's a human being, as I said before. Um, and, and to get that zero party data, like it's have to build, you have to build that trust. And if you don't, they'll never give it to you and you'll never get that valuable data that will then feed and support all of your other tactics and strategies downstream for the, for the business. 
Okay. So the third challenge I wanted to call out was getting more from an existing budget. So how do we get more content um, and, and output from, uh, from a budget uh, that's fixed and probably not going to change? And depending on the macroeconomic client next year, uh, maybe, maybe it's shrinking, whether in actual dollars or, or maybe because of inflation. So how, how do we get more um, from what we have? Well, there's a great quote. A lot of Art, a lot of folks have said this in business. This one is Steve Jobs. A lot of artists have said this. Um, deciding what not to do is, can sometimes be more important right, than deciding what to do. So I wanted to look at two trends. One is a trend we've all been hearing about for the last eight months that I think is indicative of what we shouldn't focus on. And then a second trend that I think is going to be of major importance to, to boosting um, the output from, uh, without, increasing, uh, without increasing budget. Okay, so the first trend is the metaverse. And the metaverse is, I know we've probably all heard about it, like it was a big, like it's been a big deal, like a year ago, Vanity Fair said the metaverse is going to change everything. Bill Gates said that every meeting is going to be in the metaverse in two or three years. So I think that's like 23 and 24, like we're going to, you know, no more webinars, we're going to have our headsets on and be in the metaverse, like meeting and talking with people. Um, and then, you know, metaverse was going to be important to B2B marketing, to consumer marketing, like everything we do is, it was going to be important to sort of gauge, uh, to engage in this metaverse space, these these virtual worlds that um, were supposed to take off and get really, really big. So uh, what we've been talking with clients uh, this quarter about is like revisiting those promises. Those were big statements made over the last 18 months. Like how is the metaverse actually going? Well, it's not going particularly great in a couple of different areas. So one key part of the metaverse are NFTs, which are like digital collectibles. They're more than collectibles. They can be part of loyalty programs. They can be access to, you know, offline physical events as, you know, sort of for brand building. There's also different ways to use NFTs. Um, they're really hot and really popular. Well, the trading volume for NFTs this year has dropped 97%. So the market for these things has really collapsed. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's it's uh, the 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 energy and money and attention and interest in these things is evaporating very 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 quickly. The second metric to share. So now we'll go from NFTs over to the actual metaverses. Um, one of them is called Decentraland. There's kind of three big metaverses. Decentraland is one of them. Well, 0.26%. It's a very, very small percent. That's the number of users Decentraland has compared to Fortnite, which if any of you have like kids, they probably play incessantly. Um, just one example of a really popular game that like a million kids play, right? But like Decentraland has less than 1% of the people engaging in Fortnite, uh, which um, the, the, the video game. So uh, this, and this is one of the major metaverses out there. So the, the people aren't necessarily coming. The other big player in the metaverse is, is Facebook with Horizon Worlds. So this is their multi-billion dollar massive bet. It's why they renamed the company Facebook to Meta. So this, was, this is the other big, you know, 800 pound gorilla in the metaverse space. Um, and the, the, the metrics there are not particularly um, uh, promising for growth in the metaverse either. So the headset that you need to go into Facebook's um, uh, metaverse is, uh, is about $1,400. It's more expensive than an iPhone. About half of those headsets are never used again after the first six months. Um, uh, only, only about 9% of the worlds created within the metaverse actually get a single visitor. So most of them don't ever get anyone to come by. Um, and then it, after a month, almost, almost a hundred percent of users don't go back after a month of using, um, Facebook's metaverse. So the, the numbers are, are quite chilling in terms of, um, uh, in terms of engagement and the engagement just isn't there. So I, I, I think this is a, an important lesson about, allocating resources. So this was supposed to be a big trend and there's still lots of people saying it's a big trend, but none of the data is supporting that. So from our perspective, if you're, if you're allocating resources or attention or budgets to the metaverse in 2023, that's a great opportunity to take all those dollars and reallocate them um, and put them on something um, that, uh, that you have better data for showing that you just get a better return on. Um, not a not particularly good, good area. But real briefly, why did the metaverse fail? Well, in, in um, you know, retrospect, looking back over the last 18 months, people trying to dominate the space, for the metaverse to be successful required three miracles, new content, new hardware, and new behavior. Um, websites don't work in the metaverse. You need entirely new content. You need that big headset, new hardware, like it's expensive and you have to strap it to your head. And the new consumer behavior, right? You have to like sit around with the headset on, like at home and at work and, you know, rather than just like looking at a camera on your laptop. Um, it's, you can pull off one of these miracles in, in, in introducing a new product. 
you might be able to pull off two. It's incredibly hard, maybe, but it's just impossible to do all three. It's just, it is just too insurmountable a challenge. So um, will the metaverse happen? Yes, but it's probably a timeline measured in decades. It's definitely, there's no indications right now that this is something probably in our working careers that we have to focus on or it'll be sort of a part of it. Okay, so the second trend that I wanted to call out for how to get more um, content and more value from your existing budgets, um, this is a, a new trend this year, which I think is going to have a big impact for all of us in our work in the next probably one to five years, which is generative AI. And if you're not familiar with this, this is a series of algorithms that came out really this year that are able to create um, incredible imagery in seconds from simple text descriptions that humans write, right? So this picture was generated by um, an algorithm in like a second, and the input was something like a, a photorealistic picture of a frog on a rock. And just a human typed that text in, and then one of these AIs created this image. It's beautiful, it's, it's an incredible image, right? Um, and these, uh, these generative AI uh, breakthroughs this year, where there's a couple of them, there's a, there's a few where it's happening with, but but the um, the quality of the images and, and the ability for these algorithms to interpret simple human inputs um, for different styles and imagery and, and things, it's really revolutioning, revolutionizing the idea of, of getting you know, images that you need for content, a very, very simple use case. But the use cases are much broader than just need an image for a piece of content. Um, this is from Sequoia. It's a great um, they, they, they released a couple of weeks ago. This is just a landscape of generative AI, right? And, I, and I'm just showing this to, to demonstrate it's not just images that algorithms are going to create, but we're going to see short form video, we're going to see headlines, we're going to see content, SEO um, attributes for articles. Um, there, there's just so many use cases for generative AI within just a marketing context. It's not going to replace anything that we do from creating content because there'll always need to be humans involved, but it is very likely going to speed up certain steps that you do in the process. And then you can take the time you saved in, for example, finding the perfect image for a piece of content because you just type it into a box and then it's yours and it's licensed. If that took 10 minutes, generative AI will do it in one minute, maybe one to two minutes. And that eight minutes you can go take and allocate to another step in the process where you'll derive more value where the computers um, can't help you. Right? So this is not going to replace anything that you do, but it's going to free up time and crucial steps. And if you're smart about reallocating that time in the, to get the maximum return in other areas of your content strategy, then you're going to outpace your peers um, and really drive uh, better results and engagement for your brand. So this is a really, really exciting space. I think we're going to see a lot of products around here to help out marketers you know, next year and for the next couple of years around a whole bunch of different areas. It's really, it's really going to be interesting. The impact, though, of the ability to create, you know, images really easily is on the scale now of the images you have to deal with. So in, in a non-generative world, the typical brand uh, organization has about 50,000 images, right? That, that's pretty, that's average. And because there's multiple versions of every image, it's probably almost a quarter of a million assets on average that an organization has to use in all of their content efforts, right? It's a huge library. But if you have generative, then it's really easy to create like 30 frog photos on a rock, a green, 30 green frogs sitting on a rock that are photorealistic, and you can just kind of pick out the exact right one that you want. But that is going to create a, a huge increase in the amount of images um, that are within all of our libraries uh, within organizations, right? So it's not going to be a quarter of a million. It could easily multiply that tenfold. We could be talking about two, three, four, five, you know, 10 million um, in terms of average size, uh, because the cheaper and easier it is to create images and video because the algorithms are doing it, the more we're going to have um, and the more we could potentially reuse. So, so taming all of that chaos, like today, it's kind of, it's kind of chaos with, um, with content and images and media to support it. Generative is just going to put you know, gasoline on that fire and, and, and going to make it um, an even bigger pile. And so it's going to be crucial, really, really crucial to be able to tame that, cha uh, that chaos. And that's what, that's what Jake is going to talk about um, next. And I'm going to hand it off to Jake. Yeah, thank you so much, Justin. I always enjoy your your insights, and uh, you know, as Justin mentioned, you know, we are already dealing with content chaos, and it's only going to grow as uh, many organizations today are investing in a lot of new technology and uh, and <clears throat> and systems to create, organize, and deliver more content and more content-driven experiences. And so many businesses are attempting to solve their content problems with siloed technology and manually intensive, redundant work. And that's really no way to work today. Uh, and we 
frequently see multiple content management systems used across businesses for their corporate websites, customer forums, mobile apps, commerce sites, campaign microsites, and a whole lot more. And then the creative files that are used across those channels are all scattered across, say, multiple hard drives and desktops and shared folders and file sharing tools and CMS media libraries and so much more. And this ultimately leads to more content chaos and a very fragmented brand ecosystem, which again, is, is no way to work today. And so, as you know, the status quo doesn't scale. And the process we just walked through leads to more challenges for your organization to overcome with content assets that are scattered across multiple systems and file shares, creating that content sprawl. And then branded materials are inconsistent, outdated or off brand, which leads to inconsistent digital experiences, which is not good for your customer experience. And workflows require too much manual intervention across marketing, creative, and IT teams, which causes rework and creative fatigue and a lack of that creative freedom. And then go-to-market timelines are slowed due to inefficient processes throughout that content lifecycle, which ultimately leads to lacking the ability to find the right content and assets needed to deliver those impactful digital experiences that you're seeking to create in a timely manner, which ultimately impacts sales, the employee experience, and so much more. So how do you close this content gap? Well, sticking with the power of three here, overcoming the content chaos requires content that is accessible and reusable across teams and across functions. It requires integrated technology to ensure that the creation of on-brand experiences and brand compliance ultimately are top of mind and front and center for your content producers and connected customer experiences supporting the journey throughout with unified content across all channels. And that's why we bring to you Acquia's composable content platform, which provides organizations with the freedom to create and organize content for ambitious digital experiences. And Acquia's content platform solves the content challenges by putting content at the center of the digital experience from creation to distribution, content remains that centerpiece. And this creates a consistent branded experience across all digital channels and unites your teams, including creative, marketing, and IT in their workflows, ensuring that the best, most up-to-date compliant assets and content are being distributed and used throughout that digital landscape. This ultimately enables your team to achieve content agility that you seek and need today. So what can your team achieve by leveraging Acquia's composable content platform consisting of content management and digital asset management systems combined? Well, you can deliver amazing digital experiences by connecting with your customers from easily finding and accessing digital assets when creating new content to easily updating, optimizing, and delivering that content across your digital channels. You can also increase time to market by in increasing how you create, update, and deliver the content for your customers faster and achieving true content agility by putting content at the core of your digital experience and ensure the content you serve from the assets to the website and more are brand compliant and consistent across your digital portfolio and increase operational efficiency by enabling your entire team, technical users to business users to work in parallel, eliminating your workflow bottlenecks to monitoring the effectiveness of your website and all of its assets, optimizing SEO, driving higher search rankings, more traffic, faster websites, pulling in the right assets at the right time for the right audience, and minimize security risks with the highest level of built-in security protocols and an extensive compliance portfolio out of the box. 
And through the combined power of CMS and DAM working together, your organization can overcome the content chaos and enjoy a more scalable, flexible, and secure way to work in delivering content at the center of the digital experience. Now with that, we've shared a lot about content strategy and some of the technologies in support of your content, uh, 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 your content strategy. And now we wanna share a few short stories of how some remarkable customers and brands like you are overcoming their content challenges and delivering better digital experiences with the power of CMS and DAM combined. And so with that, I turn it over to Tammy. Thank you, Jake. Uh, so I have the very fun part of the presentation where I get to share all of the customer stories that cover off on what Justin and Jake both covered today. So we'll start with a leading electric motorcycle company who wanted to deliver uh, their vision of creating the next generation of motorcycles by presenting rich multimedia experiences across their sites alongside compelling content that both educated and excited their prospective customers. But in parallel with this initiative, they were really looking to create a single source of truth for their digital assets, as well as increase their media organization and workflow capabilities. A lot of the same goals that we've talked about, uh, many organizations looking to achieve today. And with Aquia's cloud platform, the site is now able to effectively capture the emotion and the experience of enjoying their electric uh, motorcycles, as well as their brand as a whole. And Aquia Dam by Widen allows their team members to seamlessly update media and all of the related content, creating that single source of truth for digital assets, as well as uh, increasing their workflow inefficiencies, uh, achieving all the goals that they were they had set out from the get, from the get go. As Justin touched on, really working backwards from those goals at the front. In addition, the site's virtual bike building experience allowed their customers to experience what customization options looked like and felt like without the need to visit a showroom in person. So therefore enhancing their digital experiences. Ultimately, their organization was able to achieve implementation in just one month. And they were also able to launch five different global sites in one month as well. So two massive accomplishments. And when they went out and launched a pre-order page for one of their new bikes, it sold out in just minutes. So again, Aquia's platform here uh, enabled this organization to really deliver their brand experience across a multitude of their sites and you know uh, different parts of their site, really fueled by the content they were creating. Next, we'll take a look at Invent, which is a holding company with three core business segments and 10 plus established brands. And Invent decided to migrate their entire sites, all of their websites, to a single unified Drupal platform after struggling with multiple and increased costs and complexities associated with having their sites and brands around, uh, dispersed across disparate systems, both content management and commerce. So the goal really was to improve the customer experience. So like we said, putting the customer first and remembering that there are people, human beings at the end of these digital experiences. And they really wanted to enable their customers uh, to have a better experience when searching for, customizing and ordering their products. Uh, but they were faced with very tight deadlines due to impending uh, and expiring, inspiring licenses that they needed to really find a scalable, reliable and secure solution quickly. With Aquia Solutions, Invent was able to remove barriers and make their products more accessible, more discoverable for their customers. And it really informed their decisions. They were able to find the information they needed to drive their purchasing decisions. And ultimately, Invent was able to save $1 million per year in WebSphere and Adobe licensing fees. And the company's revenue achieved a 28.68% increase year over year. So again, just another example here uh, of an organization that was enabled by Aquia's platform to turn their struggling digital initiative into a major business driver that increased both their conversions as well as their revenue. And we'll cover off uh, before I hand it back over to Justin and Jake with another example here of Novavax. And Novavax before the COVID-19 pandemic was a very small biotech company with a small digital footprint. 
However, with the pandemic and the organization's vaccine candidate, it propelled the company onto a, glo a global wo world stage, and they needed to evolve their web presence in order to meet that new global demand while simultaneously future-proofing their sites uh, for the future. So the previous site they had contained tons of legacy content that in order to migrate would have been very complex, very timely, and not efficient. Uh, and they really needed to focus on building the new digital infrastructure correctly so they would save their team time and resources during that migration and into the future. Adding to that complexity, Novavax also wanted to launch five different websites simultaneously. They were really go-getters there. Uh, so Novavax started by completely rebuilding and redesigning Novavax.com from mapping the ideal customer journey for each persona to design and development, all the way down to creating content strategies for each persona, all while providing relevant information to stakeholders globally. So really taking that customer view into perspective and understanding how content not just would serve different uh, touch points individually, but the holistic journey of both the content and the customer. Using a low-code atomic design framework for rapid page building and development, Novavax was able to now deploy sites in days. I say days, a new site. Uh, and most pages were designed within the development environment, refined, and then submitted for review and approval, which massively expedited their processes and was able to help them deliver on business objectives quickly. With Acquia Cloud Platform and Acquia Cloud Edge, it gave them the scalability needed to design and build their sites quickly, uh, but it also ensured that they were protected from the rise in security attacks. They were able to leverage trans translation modules to serve global audiences. As I mentioned, they were a small digital, uh, uh, digital site and then launched into that global uh, world, really needed to be able to deliver all that content to a multitude of audiences in a multitude of languages. Uh, so they were able to ensure that frictionless exchange of translated copy between their sites and between their translation vendors. They were even able to localize critical information for the global vaccines authorization and approval map for most of their markets. And Acquia Dam by Wyden provided that single source of truth for all regulatory docs around the globe, which is in incredibly important for an industry uh, like Novavax's. They were able to uh, offer that single link, source link, for each of those assets across multiple materials, whether it be a brochure they were handing out at Congress, an event presentation on their website, or even on QR codes that were linked within their labels. And research to launch was done in just 10 months, while the design and build work consumed about half of that time, so about five months. And just to give context here, in December of 2021, Novavax had only two English-only websites. So 2021, two English-only websites, and today it has 172 websites in 40-plus countries and in 35-plus languages. So massive, massive growth. And with their objective to both explain Novavax's science and technology, as well as focus on improving their content depth, they saw massive metrics here. They saw viewership increase by 83%. They saw time spent on their site increase by 200%. And the traffic from social media channels rose by 198% in the three months post-launch. So incredible story here with fantastic metrics so much growth. And as you know, we work with customers like yourselves to achieve similar growth and achieve similar goals, uh, these are just a few great examples of how we've done that. So I'll hand it to Justin to cover off on the last story here. Awesome. Thanks, Tammy. Um, okay, so the last one is Dartmouth. And to tell you about Dartmouth, I want to tell a quick story about my alma mater, USC, the University of Southern California. So years ago, the president of the university, so just taking a step back, for those who don't have an experience working with universities, they are very, very federated. So they they are very often a collection of independent units that sort of operate and do their own thing. So the business school will do, do do their own thing. Their architecture school have their own website and their own approaches and their own marketing and their own admissions teams. So it's a very, very federated environment. So there can be a lot of people running in every direction. So um, the USC president was uh, frustrated about the lack of consistent USC branding across this ecosystem. So he, um, he got uh, uh, brochures from every single one of the uh, schools 
covered his conference table in all of those brochures and then had a meeting with every marketing leader at the same time to, from every single school came into his office. They all sat around the conference room table and he said, look at this table and look at everything on here. And they all just looked at it and said, yeah, okay, I can see mine. I can see the school of dentistry, whatever. Um, and he was like, I can't tell that this is all USC because they're all different. And then he said, next year when we have this meeting, they're all going to look the same. <laughs> and that was the beginning for USC to do a journey of aligning their brand, right? And so guardrails are super, super crucial when you have big complex organizations, whether it's higher ed or not. You have a global brand typically, you have a global brand voice, you have global brand images and colors and tone and approach. You want that to be consistent. Um, and if you don't apply any sort of guardrails and it's just gonna be complete chaos and everyone's gonna come and do their own thing. Um, and and there are different ways to do those, those guardrails, but the, the best lesson about the power of guardrails is um, a story about the automobile. And uh, if you ask like, hey, what was the single um, uh, most uh, impactful innovation for making driving safer? If you ask somebody that, they'll say the you know daytime headlights or the airbag or a seatbelt or crumple zones or you know better, better crash technology. Um, all those helped, but the single most impactful thing that made driving safer in the United States was the highway. Consistent lighting, consistent um, lane markers, and consistent separators between two different directions of traffic, guardrails. The guardrails were the key there, and they had the greatest single impact. So organizations that find the right balance of guardrail tend to be more agile, right? So you have there are certain things that nobody can change across the organization, but then you still have to define those areas where they can do what they want, operate independently, be efficient, um, you know, speak to their specific customers and audiences and really, really be unique. So it's just, it's really, really crucial, I think, to find to find that right balance. Dartmouth did a, a great job of that. They're, they're, um, and that they've done a great job of that for years. They're, they're a client of ours. We, we launched the redesign last year. Um, and what they did was uh, they focused around this brand consistency around imagery. So Dartmouth is a collection like many universities of sort of federated units and they had lots of imagery, but they wanted to make sure that imagery was used consistently, both internal to departments and schools and, and divisions throughout Dartmouth, um, as well as external users. And so they used the Acquia Dam um, tightly coupled with their um, with their CMS, or their, their Drupal instance on Acquia, and um, really set up a nice way for multiple parties to access imagery that was on brand, on tone, but still was a really massive library that people could find exactly what they wanted to sort of tell their own story, but still in the Dartmouth way. Um, did a really, really effective job of this with Dam. The, the most popular photo used at Dartmouth is the students who want their annual class photo. And then you can see that in the screenshot here. Um, that's the whole class every year they take this photo and you know, the graduates want it, parents want it, grandparents want it. Um, and so one of the assets that they are these class photos. It's the most popular asset in the whole system. But they took the time to really build that great um, environment where people could self-serve, but still self-serve in the right way. And, and, and so Dartmouth got what it wanted, which was brand consistency. And then all those other units got what they wanted, which was efficiency, a really quick way to find like the right image. So great success story with Dan here, taming a, a, um, taming a, a big, a big uh, content and media ecosystem. Okay, so uh, real quick, we have a couple of questions. I want to make sure we have time to answer. So we'll just uh, we'll just jump through these and get to the Q and A. Um, uh, Jake and I want to share sort of quick uh, three lessons, three highlights from today, sort of sort of takeaways that we think are are important. One I, I talked about earlier: work backwards. Um, start with the end in mind. Start with the outcome and work backwards, getting further and further away from that in order to identify um, and inform what you should actually do. Second one is is um, uh, be holistic. So I, we talked about the need to be strategic and take sizes you can do to kind of force yourself to see the forest for the trees. Um, so do that when it comes to content strategy at the core of the customer journey. So take that time to, uh, to do that exercise. Jake, you wanna cover the third one? Yeah, and our third one, choose wisely. Your technology must be flexible and we believe a composable solution that allows you to stitch together the right mix of tools to support your content strategy uh, is really the most agile and effective way to work. 